Hi everybody and welcome back to Talk Gnosis. This is part two of four of our conversation with Dr. M. David Litva of Virginia Tech talking about deification, personal deification, divinization, theosis, and all that good stuff. Last time we talked about those things in relation to monotheism and we talked about the divinity of Jesus and where those things uh, those ideas came from. In this episode, we're going to continue with those uh, that line of thought. We're going to talk about uh, how kings and emperors were considered gods in the ancient world and what uh, that kind of political ramifications of divinity for uh, regular human beings uh, is in that context. We're talking about Gnostic cosmology as an act of political defiance, and we'll talk a little bit about which parts of the New Testament uh, is Jesus actually considered divine and which parts is he considered just a human being? Uh, if those are even relevant distinctions, stay tuned and you'll find out. Coming up on this episode, part two of four of our conversation, Dr. M. David Litva and personal deification. We backtrack a little bit. Uh, the, um, just in passing, uh, we talked, uh, you mentioned um, about how sort of the ground is already laid for understanding Jesus as a divine figure. And you mentioned the uh, the king, the, the king of Israel. Um, and uh, I understand, so the king of Israel was understood while he was alive to be a divine figure. And I also want to combine that with another question. Wasn't the Roman emperor somehow understood to be a god even when he was alive? But, you know, these are both obviously men that people serve and can see and go to the royal court and, and touch. Like, how, how, could, how did people understand these rulers as simultaneously being gods? And did, did this affect any religious approaches? Did it have an impact in how people thought about divinity in the uh, ancient Mediterranean world? Absolutely. I like to think of ancient religion as simply politics, but it's the politics of heaven. Mm. Gods and kings are the exact analogs of each other, and so on heaven, or so in heaven, so on earth. So if you've got divine kings on earth, that really makes sense to an ancient person because God actually is a king. And I don't think the ancients thought of that as a metaphor. I just think they thought of that as the absolute truth. God is a king. It's logical that kings on earth are gods. This is a phenomena, although a lot of people in Jewish studies would resist this, the idea that ancient Jews had a ruler cult. I think it's absolutely true that the king did receive a kind of veneration. Uh, he is actually called God. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, again using Elohim in the Psalms and being called the Son of God in Psalm 2, uh, or actually in a kind of ritual ceremony, apparently, where the king becomes the Son of God. I don't think the Son of God is just a cute metaphor. I think he really does become the Son of Yahweh, and therefore becomes worthy of the kind of worship and veneration that someone participating in Yahweh's power would receive. And although uh, that may be offensive to some, I just think that's what the, the historical data points to. Now, it is true that you have ruler cult really ramping up after Alexander the Great, uh, and it's really he who invents the Greek concept of divine kingship, and it's absolutely clear that he was in his lifetime considered son of Zeus and considered a divine being and possibly considered himself to be a divine being and was worshipped as such, and later rulers, his successors, experienced the same phenomena. They were living gods who had hymns and sacrifices in their honor. And when the Romans came along, it's absolutely true that they also received sacrifices and praise and worship that was due to a deity. It's true that there was some attempt to distinguish the kinds of sacrifices and praise that they received. For instance, in the Jewish temple, they would offer a sacrifice on behalf of Caesar Augustus rather than to him. And sometimes this would be repeated in other cult sites. But it's also true that not far from Jerusalem, in Caesarea Maritima, you had a temple of Caesar Augustus built by no less than Herod the Great, in which Caesar Augustus is depicted as the image of Zeus and has a cult statue that is 40 feet high and where Jews and non-Jews come to worship and where the remains exist today. So it's absolutely clear that the Jews were familiar with ruler cult 
and that the Roman emperors were worshipped in their lifetime. Did they actually see these rulers? Not really. Um, the then, but their image was ubiquitous, and if you go to any kind of museum today, especially in Italy, you will see thousands of images of the emperor depicted as a living god, because that is what he was. Did this influence how Christians thought of Jesus, the king of the universe? Absolutely. There's no question if you are the king of the cosmos that you are a divine figure. And the idea of a divine human being, although radical to us today, is absolutely standard and common in the ancient world. This is very hard for people to get their minds around, but it's, it's absolutely everywhere in the culture. Deification is just the standard for those who rise to a certain level of authority and power. It's not just those who have, and for the philosophers, who rise to a level of, of moral perfection. That actually um, is pretty illustrative of um, how a, a, a figure in the, uh, in the Middle East at this time calling himself, or his followers calling him, the son of God, uh, could actually be seen as a threat to the ruling elite. Um, you know, if... if uh, if the king is supposedly also a son of God. I mean, I, I think that that is very true. And a lot of people have wanted to say that certain texts in the Gospels and in the epistles of Paul are anti-imperial because they portray Jesus as cosmic Lord. But a point that I often like to mention is that may be anti-imperial, but it's also, in a sense, pro-imperial because mm -hmm. it, it's merely a change mm. in the king. The, the Christians are using the same tropes, the same basic ideas for divinizing not the emperor, but this particular Jewish peasant from a no-name town in Nazareth. That's what's radical. But they're, they are adapting all the time elements from their the ruler cult from their own political context and applying it to Jesus. I don't see that as particularly anti-imperial. I see that as these gospels are, these gospel writers are using the imperial politics to their own advantage mm -hmm. and giving us a Jesus who is the true cosmocrator, the true pantocrator, the true one who is the emperor of the cosmos. They don't get there without Roman politics. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. mm. Sorry to interrupt, but we need your help. Talk Gnosis and all of the shows on the Gnostic Wisdom Network are free and will always be free, but it does cost us a lot of time and money to actually make these shows. So what I'd like to ask is that if you have enjoyed our programming, if you've found something useful uh, about it, if you've been educated, please consider becoming a patron over on our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash gnostic. We've got a whole bunch of new shows that we'd like to start making, but we can't do it until we can start to support ourselves a little bit more financially. And um, we really hope that you will assist us in our goals. Uh, we've got a great show coming up about sex and spirituality with uh, Reverend Mr. Jonathan Stewart from Talk Gnosis and his wife Sarah Beale. Uh, we've got The Lost Word coming back, Esoteric Freemasonry and Fraternal Orders and initiate, Initiatory Orders and all that kind of thing. We've got Temples and Tentacles uh, with some weird fiction authors, kind of Lovecraftian spirituality stuff that I think you're really going to like. Plus some really interesting kind of fictional and um, uh, kind of entertainment based things that we want to do that also have kind of an esoteric and Gnostic educational component. So please, uh, we need your help to make all of this possible. We have big dreams, but we don't have a lot of resources to make those dreams a reality. So please do visit patreon.com slash Gnostic if you haven't already and uh, pledge. You just give a small amount of money uh, for every educational media thing that we put out. And then at the end of the month, your, your card gets charged. You can set an upper limit so that you're, ne you're never surprised by uh, too many things getting charged on your card per month. It's really very easy and very painless, and it makes a huge difference 
to the Gnostic Educational Ministry of the Gnostic Wisdom Network, the Apostolic Joe and I Church, and all of us here who work so hard to bring you this, um, what we think anyway, is pretty great content. So if you agree, that's patreon.com slash Gnostic. Sorry again for the interruption and back to the show. We stay on the, the anti-imperial theme just for a second to to jump ahead to our our precious uh, Gnostics or our precious Sepians. Uh, like you mentioned, it's just obvious to to people at the time that uh, that that God is a king, God is an emperor, right? Because they look around them, they see the God and the emperor who is the God on earth, as it is on earth, as you said, it must be above. So, are are the Archons and Yalda Bayoff? Is that an anti-imperial reaction to what's going on on Earth? Because I can see the thought process where you're dealing with a very annoying ruler, a bureaucrat, an unfair ruler. So you, obviously, if you're already in this worldview, you're like, well, that's what it must be like in heaven. Well, <laughs> uh, I, I think you're on to something. Uh, I do think that there is political criticism in the Gnostic writings, but I... I also think that they take seriously the idea that our world really is controlled by evil superpowers who they do call archons or rulers. And so in a sense, the emperor and his cronies and the whole Roman bureaucracy and administration is essentially a puppet show. The, the people really running the show are these demonic agents who are at the center and behind the scenes, sort of like the man behind the curtain and the Wizard of Oz, that they're the really ones who they are criticizing. And so the, the object of the criticism, yes, indirectly is the Roman government and the bureaucracy and the terrible exploitation, economic and socially. But they really do think that those people are just an epiphenomenon of the actual evil demonic infrastructure running this entire cosmos. So, okay, it's anti-imperial, but it, that's only secondary. Yeah, and echoes of that all the way up to the 70s where you have Philip K. Dick talking about the empire never ended. And, uh, right. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, and I think that's absolutely true. I think that the, the you know, the Sethians specifically were, were talking about a world in which these um, archons and spirits and, and whatever they were calling them um, were absolutely real. And they absolutely had, um, had their fingers in the pies of all of the, um, you know, the, the political machinations that were going on at the time. And, um, were actually talking about when they talked about the these archons were actually talking about the uh, spiritual powers behind the scenes of the actual powers who um, were uh, were kind of puppets right I mean it goes back to that that phrase in Paul in first Corinthians where he says that the the archons crucified the Lord of glory because they didn't know who he, who he was. And the interpretive question is, who are the archons? Right. Is he actually yeah. talking about the human rulers, the, the, the Romans nailing Jesus to the cross? Or is he talking about these demonic agents who are operative in the sky and behind the scenes? And I think it's really both and. But I think even for Paul, and if you want to Paul call Paul a Gnostic, you know. And we do. That, that's fine. <laughs> but I, I think he's really, he's demonic infrastructure. And I think he really views these Romans as essentially puppets. And to speak against Rome and to be a political rebel, that makes no sense. Because you're only fighting the epiphenomena. You're only fighting that superficial veneer. Mm -hmm. What Paul and the Gnostics are worried about is the man behind the curtain. That's the one you need to attack. That's the one you need to get by. That's the only way out of this universe. 
echoes to our current uh, election cycle here in the United yeah. States. <laughs> the, the, the conspiracy theorists are going to definitely chime in in the comments section. Yes, um, please do. I love those. Yeah, those do. are fantastic. <laughs> those are the best. Uh, Dr. Litba, you actually brought us up to my next two leading questions. Uh, we're going to touch on Paul on one of them and then get right into him in the next. But uh, so, so I've heard this view that um, – so basically a more traditional Christian view, that the entire Christian Bible, what's sometimes called the New Testament, presents Jesus as a, as the Son of God, uh, fully God, fully human. Um, and I've also heard, heard from scholars and people on the internet, maybe not from scholars, <laughs> but I've also heard that uh, some books of the New Testament don't show Jesus as divine at all, like, uh, say, Mark. Uh, and he's only divine in John and the Pauline letters. So those two views are either of those correct well uh, again it's a it's a good complex nice leading question <laughs> um, I one thing that I will say is this formulation of fully divine fully human is a fourth century formulation and we need just to throw that out uh, in the first century um, I'm not sure that that's just it's just not an issue. Um, my own take on it is this, and it's only my take that I think. Let's use the example of the Gospel of Mark. So he looks like a normal human dude, and he goes around performing miracles and gets his uh, gets crucified in the end, and then by report is, rises from the dead and in his trial he says what he has been avoiding avoided saying throughout his entire ministry that he actually is the messiah and he adds to that this prophecy from daniel that he actually is the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven and sitting at the right hand of the power now is this a divine figure um I think Mark leaves it a little bit ambiguous, but there are signs that he definitely is divine, and I would point to two signs that in the transfiguration scene, where all of a sudden this guy has beams of light bursting out of his clothes, and he starts talking with men who ought to be dead, and has this... It, you have this overwhelming experience that can only be described as an epiphany in which only gods really do that sort of thing. And then his final claim at the trial that he is the son of man or the son of the human who will sit at the right hand of the power, I think tip the balance for me and I would say that this is a hidden god figure that we know occurs all over Greek and Roman mythology where the gods come for a period of time and they don't reveal their true nature hmm. until usually the end and they often they give usually a sign come to impregnate some <laughs> random peasant woman right <laughs> well uh, not always <laughs> uh, if you're a reader of Homer you're familiar with the gods intervening for any number of reasons and they come in human form they all come in human form. They never come in some divine or supernatural form. They're all hidden deities. And they deliberately hide themselves and they sojourn on earth, usually for a fairly short time. I think what he actually. With uh, Bakai, right? He, uh, he's a normal human and then he just, all of a sudden, he reveals himself at the end in, after the city tears himself apart. Is Who, that, that was, an example? What was oh. your example? Oh, sorry, uh, the, the, the Bacchae, the Bacchae. Uh, oh, okay. Was, and Euripides? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Euripides. Yeah, I, I think that's a good example where you have Dionysus you, coming, obviously in disguised form, and he remains disguised for a long period of time throughout the entire play. And it's only in the end that, yes, he reveals his true form. And I think that this is basically the structure of the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus is deliberately hiding not only his messiahship, but also his divinity. And that it only becomes clear that he's a divine being when 
essentially you can't kill him. And even when you do kill him, he rises from the dead. But that's the ultimate proof of divinity. And we saw a sign of this in the transfiguration, that he's a divine being and his divine form can burst out of his human form when he wants. And his claim to be essentially God's chief vizier, the cosmocrator who's going to rip through the skies at the end of time, that really can only describe a divine being in the ancient world. So I have to put my money on all the Gospels supporting a kind of divine Jesus. That doesn't at all mean that he's human, fully human, or human at all, but he certainly looks that way. And in Matthew, born human. But as you know, also from Greek mythology, you can have Heracles born from a human mother and still be a god, and you can have Romulus born from a human mother and be divinized in the end. This isn't a problem to be born. Uh, you can still become a god from your humanity. That's not a problem. Or in the case of the Johannine model, you can come as a pre-existent deity. Either way, I think we're dealing with a divine figure in almost every book of the New Testament. Some books, frankly, don't talk a lot about Jesus, so we don't know. Thank you.